Okay, I'd like to introduce Robert Freeland, who's a director for Icarus Interstellar. And like most people in here, it's hard to imagine him not being passionate about our core mission to go explore nearby <laughs> stars. He's the uh, deputy project leader and core designer for the uh, flagship project Icarus, and is here to give us an update on our approach for doing that. So, turn over to you. Thank you, Les. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, as Les said, I'm a director for Icarus Interstellar, which is an umbrella organization for a number of projects that are devoted to our core mission, which is achieving interstellar flight by the year 2100. Um, the flagship uh, project for our organization, which actually predates the formation of the organization, was Project Icarus. So if you could flip to the next slide for me, please. Um, you're all familiar with this one by now, I'm sure. Um, but we've made some uh, decisions about our target and some other things over the last couple of years that get me to the summary down there at the bottom, which is to design a credible, unmanned, fusion-based probe using current technology that's capable of fully decelerating a functional 150-ton scientific payload into orbit around the Alpha Centauri system within 100 years of launch. So that's it in a nutshell. Go to the next slide, please. Um, as Rob mentioned earlier, we had a design competition in London last year where we uh, broke up into a number of different groups and explored different propulsion systems. And the outcome of that was uh, four different ship designs using different propulsion systems. And I uh, worked on this particular one, which was a Z-pinch drive. Now, it didn't look like this when I presented it in London. Um, what we've done since then, um, and I've done this in coordination with uh, Michel Lamontagne from uh, Canada, I've uh, done a lot of work on improving that design from London, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Can go to the next slide, please. Um, this uh, ship uses a Z-pinch drive, and um, a Z-pinch is something many of you might be familiar with now. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon in nature where you drive a current through some kind of conductor, and it generates a magnetic field around that conductor, which then crosses with the current itself to generate a force toward the middle. So it pinches whatever it's going through. Can I go to the next slide, please? Um, this slide was in Rob's presentation, but I, I love it because it shows you two things that show you this, this is real. Okay, you've got lightning, which is a G pinch, and then you've got this uh, rod that got struck by lightning. And you can see that it didn't get blown up, okay? It got crushed. And that's what happens when you get the current running through a conductor. Can go to the next one, please? Um, if you're trying to turn this into a fusion drive, what you're going to try to do is uh, use a plasma there where it's getting crushed. And so this is a basic little uh, drawing of how that would work. You're sending a current through this plasma, and of course it induces the uh, magnetic current, which crushes the, uh, the pinch. And now down there at the bottom, you can see we've got the Bennett-Pinch relation, which really is the, uh, the basic formula that describes how these things work, where you're balancing the uh, magnetic pressure against the, uh, the pressure of the plasma. Next slide, please. Um, this is a little drawing of how one of these pinches would initiate, um, and I, I credit a fellow named Sean Connect who was working at UAW on pinches there, where they actually have an experimental facility, by the way. Um, what happens is you put this, uh, this plasma in on both sides of that central electrode, and you initiate your, uh, your voltage across the plasma, which drives current through it. The, uh, the current passing through the plasma generates a magnetic field that starts to force it toward the middle, and it propagates on down um, this outer electrode uh, in, in kind of a zipper fashion until you get the, uh, the image in the bottom right corner here, which is a sustained pinch. Go to the next slide, please. Um, now, there are two big problems with Z-pinches, um, as they've been studied uh, for, well, not so much for fusion yet, but just in general trying to maintain a stable pinch, and that's these two instabilities, the sausage in instability and the kink. And what uh, Yuri Shumlak at University of Washington discovered was that if you can get the plasma moving fast enough through the pinch, the, uh, the waveforms cancel out and you can actually maintain a stable pinch. And so he developed some mathematics to describe how that works. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is his experimental apparatus where he was testing some of this stuff. Um, it's uh, only a meter uh, for the pinch itself and then another meter for that assembly region that's on the right. And I have to apologize, this is like the only slide in the entire thing where the pinch is going the opposite direction. Um, so it's blowing up that way instead of this way. Um, in any case, uh, you, know, you can see kind of the details of the experimental thing if you're interested in it. Uh, it's up on his website. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these are the results of his experiment, though, which I think is the most interesting piece because the graph on the bottom there shows the dampening of the instabilities in the plasma. And uh, you can see that it kind of just 
dampens out toward the bottom, and uh, you've got your stable plasma. So that was really exciting for me when I started reading about this stuff because that's one of the big issues with fusion. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, these are two drawings of potential fusion drives based around this uh, principle. The one at the top was drawn by Schumlach, and the one at the bottom was from Marshall Space Flight Center, where they're also doing research on this principle. So, can I go to the next one, please? Um, this is a, a kind of a collage of the various versions of Firefly as they've evolved since the London meeting. So upper left corner was what I presented in London last year, and then a bunch of drawings that Michelle has done uh, between last year and now um, showing the evolution. Now, I should say that in the drawing in the upper left corner, you, you don't see the radiator on there because it was actually a, drop, a liquid droplet fountain radiator that went out the front of the vessel. And so the idea was that all of your heat would be radiated in this, this cascading fountain. I found this uh, concept on an old design called Valkyrie. Um, sorry, I'm not close enough there. So uh, it seemed really neat, but what we discovered was that, um, A, you've got a pumping volume problem from the back where all the heat's generated to the front where you're trying to run the, uh, the fountain, and B, the acceleration of the vessel isn't really all that great, and so the droplets take a long time to go up and come back down, and as a result, you have to make them rather big, and then they get really heavy. Anyway, it just didn't work. So we, we tried uh, briefly in number two a uh, liquid droplet radiator with like fixed uh, emitters and collectors, and it, it didn't really help a whole lot. So then we finally went around to just uh, static uh, radiators, and um, somewhere along the line, right around four, uh, Michelle suggested that we go to uh, phase change radiators, which allowed us to actually deal with the amount of uh, radiation coming off of this thing. Now. Um, let's go to the next slide here for a second. Um, these are the, uh, you know, the whole question about fuel selection, and um, I'm just going to cut to the chase because you guys are all familiar with this. We decided to go with DD just because we can get the stuff and um, deal with the downside of that, which, let me go to the next slide, um, which is a lot of waste energy. Uh, you know, half of the DD fusion generates these 2.45 MeV neutrons, the other half generates tritium, which immediately reacts in the plasma to generate these 14.1 MeV neutrons. And on top of that, we've got uh, you know, x-rays coming off of the plasma from all of the, uh, the brim strolling. I mean, it's just nasty. So one of the things that became obvious as we started working on this in the very beginning was that if you try to shield all of this stuff, um, there's no way you're ever going to build a viable vessel out of it. Um, the masses are just too great. So the principle that we've undertaken with this design from the beginning is to just let as much of that radiation as possible go straight out into space. <coughs> go to the next slide, please. Um, and again, just a picture of it. I'm going to kind of walk through all the systems on this thing. So next slide, please. Um, this is a description, kind of another little diagram of how the drive works. Um, you can see the, uh, the current uh, flows through the middle of the pinch there. So it goes kind of down this one electrode on the left, through the pinch, and out this other electrode, these electrodes on the sides on the other end. and. Um, Laser yeah, I've got a laser pointer here somewhere. <laughs> nah, I don't see it. It doesn't really matter. Um, so uh, the point is that you've got this you know, huge current kind of running in this loop. And so one of the important pieces is to get that return path across the top so that we can accomplish that. Um, next slide, please. So the engine itself. Um, what I've got here at the graph in the middle, I think, is probably the most interesting piece of this, because what we did was model the uh, plasma species as they evolve down the length of the pinch. So I broke the pinch into 15 different little segments, and the output from one segment feeds the next one, and you can actually watch how the fusion reaction progresses down the length of the pinch. Um, in the beginning, you know, it's all deuterium, which is that uh, red bar on the left, and you can see a little bit of tritium. That's that little tiny sliver of yellow that shows up just on top of the red there. Um, it burns up immediately. You've got some helium-3, which is that larger yellow, yellowish-white bar above that that's kind of consistent across the thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, the question is if I can actually aim this yeah, thing. Mary, it's, a little, it's a little red arrow on the, on the end where the... Um, where I'll just blind is myself that. with it. One there we go. Up yep, up. got it. Okay. So that little bar right there is your helium-3, and you can see it kind of burns consistently as it's produced. And then this at the top is your helium-4, which is a reaction product. And this across the bottom is hydrogen, which is a reaction product. These essentially uh, serve as poisons in the plasma. So one of the things that you're trying to do when we optimize this drive is that you want to reach a point where you're, you want to stop right before you cease getting charged particles out. Um, 
at a rate higher than the energy you're putting in. Um, and there's a whole bunch of you know, math involved in getting to that point. But um, the, the general, uh, well, let me just go to the next slide. Um, this is another little diagram of uh, kind of current flows and whatnot. But um, one of the things we we're trying to get to here uh, down the side is actually calculating um, radiation loads from both the neutrons and the x-rays on various parts of the vessel. And so we've got all those tallied up. And it kind of gives us a, uh, an energy, a waste energy figure for what we actually have to radiate out or deal with otherwise. Can we go to the next one, please? Um, more diagrams that Michelle has done there on the right for uh, another part of the shielding uh, for this vessel. Now, you know, I said we we're going to let most of the radiation go directly out into space, but I mean, most is still not all. There's still some stuff that's in, impinging on the vessel itself. And so we were trying to figure out ways to not have to actually use radiators to deal with that. Um, the first piece of that solution is this conical um, tank right here. Um, now, it's coated with something, it, 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 the, the slope here from the back to the front is just under three degrees, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with Chandra and New Star, happens to be the uh, angle that you need in order to use shallow angle reflection on x-rays. So what we're hoping to be able to do is actually reflect most of the x-ray radiation off into space before it gets to this forward part. Um, the uh, inner shell of this tank, uh, it's not completely full of deuterium gas, but right along the inner shell of it, it is. And the idea there is that you're trying to achieve one hit for the most part, of, of a neutron on something in that tank before it gets to the forward part here so that it can get deflected. You know, I mean, the odds are if it hits anything, it's going off into space because this is such a shallow angle. Um, anything that makes it through that hits this uh, beryllium shield here and is either absorbed or scattered. And then you've got your you know, important stuff up forward to that. Next slide, please. Um, so the radiators then have to deal with what, whatever's left after all of that. Um, what we did was we calculated heat loads on particularly the electrodes. So right here you've got an electrode, and right here you've got an electrode. And these things are just absolutely hammered by neutrons and x-rays. And so, you know, A, you've got to use materials that can survive that, and B, you've got to get uh, all that heat out. And so that's transported up here to these sections of the radiator that are actually dedicated to those, those pieces of the vessel. And most of this, from pretty much here forward, is just dealing with these two electrodes. Um, and then the rest of it is to deal with heat in that, that tank and um, the uh, beryllium shield. Next, please. Um, again, uh, this is also kind of illustrates that concept of taking sections of the radiator and figuring out what exactly they're supposed to be handling. So next, next one, please. Um, so what would the mission look like uh, with this vessel? Um, and uh, I'm going to cut to the chase here. Okay. For Project Icarus, our goal was to get there in under 100 years. So the entire vessel is designed to keep that number under 100 years. And um, what that worked out to was um, 42,000 tons of fuel on a vessel that's slightly under 2,000 tons dry mass, which is, as I point out here, not quite the same as non-fuel mass. Um, it achieves uh, an exhaust vo velocity of just just over 10,000 uh, kilometers per second. And um, acceleration uh, period is 25 years, and then it cruises for about 70 and then spends five years decelerating. Okay, last slide, please, or next slide. Um, that just kind of rehashes what I just said. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I did a, a brief analysis in London for how much this vessel might cost because, you know, we always talk about these things and we always assume they're just exorbitantly expensive. Now, you might look at this and say that's exorbitantly expensive. Um, what, it, what it worked out to was about $35 billion a year over 15 years, which is coincidentally about twice NASA's budget on an annual basis, or if you took NASA plus ESA, it's about that. So I would say it's not completely awful. But. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so thanks to uh, Yuri Shumlak for his work uh, at University of Washington, Marshall Space Flight Center for the research that they're doing there now, uh, Michelle Montagna for all of his help over the last year to get the radiator stuff up to snuff, and of course he did all the great artwork in here, and uh, Stephen Baxter for doing some of the initial lit review that we did behind us. So that's it. Um, questions, anyone? Uh, what's the aspect ratio of the z-pinch, that is, what is the length of it divided by its diameter? Did it stable over? 
the that, that has the key parameter that determines the stability in classical z pinch dynamics. That that's exactly right. Um, the length of the pinch region itself is 75 meters. Now uh, the uh, in order to maintain a stable pinch over that length, uh, the plasma has to be shot into this thing at 500 kilometers a second. So what we essentially have is a two-stage engine because to get the plasma up to that speed, we're using an MPD thruster to get it going, and then that gets injected into the pinch where it gets pinched. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers. And as far as the diameter of the pinch, it's, it's a fraction of a millimeter, and I've forgotten exactly what. It's very, very thin, um, which consequently means that all the radiation immediately escapes. Yes, next question. One of your challenges was dissipating the excess heat, so you had some interesting things about that. Um, I was struck by a lot of your schematics are very similar to an X-ray generating tube, only in reverse. So you might want to look at an X-ray tube, which is producing huge amounts of heat, tiny little bit of radiation. And some of the things they've done to overcome that problem is actually use spinning anodes, very dense materials, and even pumping coolants through things like that. That's a great idea. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. All right, very good.